Hi folks, Denise Howell here. And next up on This Week in Law, I am joined by co-host Matt Curtis and by our guest, Sean Lynch, who is an intellectual property lawyer who does both video game and surf law. How cool is that? We're gonna talk about some surf related stuff with Sean, such as what sort of sharks we might need to be concerned with in the water and what sort of drone related surfing activities are okay as far as the surfers go and the FAA goes. Uh, Domino's channels Ferris Bueller's day off. And should your flying taxi pilot have skin in the game? We'll talk about all of these and much more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell, Matt Curtis, and Mike Keyes. Episode 384, recorded April 28th, 2017. Uber in the sky with Dubai. Hi folks, it's Denise Howell and you're joining us for This Week in Law. I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We've got some really cool Southern California vibes with us today that uh, I hope you can all tune in on. Uh, Mike Keyes up in Seattle is not going to enjoy those vibes with us today. Unfortunately, he had to scramble off to real work things at the last minute. We miss you, Mike. Hope you have a great week. We will see you next week, hopefully. But my other co-host, Matt Curtis, is here. Hello, Matt. Hi, great to be back, and uh, I'm on I'm on time this time, so feeling good about that. Great to see you. Yes, it's great to have you on time and on the show. Uh, Matt is a law student at Notre Dame School of Law and the host of the uh, Pint of Law podcast. Have you done any new episodes that we should mention before we move too far into our show, Matt? Um, yeah, so we did one uh, last week about uh, the concept of death and dying, which I thought was really interesting. There's actually mm-hmm. some copyright implications about when you die, whether it's your brain death or your heart stopping. Um, so it, it's uh, it was really fun, and Professor John Robinson did that one. <laughs> I love that you have brain death, heart stopping, and really fun in the same <laughs> sentence there and in the same <laughs> podcast. I'm looking forward to listening to that one. Uh, I'm also looking forward to introducing you to Sean Lynch or not Sean Lynch, as the case may be, if you're following <laughs> him on Twitter or Lawyer Slack. Sean, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me here. Great to have you. Uh, so Sean is our, our fellow Southern Californian in the mix here in, in addition to myself. And not just uh, geographically, but mentally also in Southern California, because one of your specialties as a lawyer, Sean, that is so fascinating to me and I think is so great, is you do work with the surf market, both um, surfers themselves and people who are on the commercial side of the world of surfing uh, related to photography and running a surf shop. What other kinds of things do you counsel people on? So uh, I actually, I specialize in intellectual property basically. And then I was as a young associate trying to think about how I can work with the community that I really care about. And I, since moving to California after undergraduate, I grew up around the Atlanta area. Um, I bought a surfboard and just started going out into the water every single day until I could do it. Um, mm-hmm. And it's I've been here for about uh, nine years now um, and surfing for all nine of those. And it's just had a profound impact on my life. So I was figuring, how can I spin what I do as an attorney into uh, the community that I really care about? Um, and there are so many photographers. There are so many surf shops. There are so many people out there that need to understand some concepts of intellectual property so that they can build their career, grow their business, whatever it is. And, and there's just not really a resource directed toward them. Um, so I, I, you know, you can always cast a broad net and say, you're an intellectual property attorney, go out and, uh, and then go out and try and get every patent client in the world. But if you're focusing in on something like something you're really passionate about or a community that you really care about, it's much easier to connect with those people. Um, and I've had reasonable success getting some surf shops with trademark issues, uh, getting some individual inventors who've come up with a new way to run a wave pool, for example. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, and I've gotten to really connect with the community that I care about and it's been a lot of fun. That's really great. And then is if that weren't cool enough, um, you're also of counsel with a firm called the MacArthur Law Firm that specializes in the intersection of law and video games. 
Yeah, that's right. So I, I really kind of living the dream here. Um, I get to <laughs> work with surfers and get to work with the surf industry and then uh, helping out with the MacArthur Law Firm and helping Stephen MacArthur grow his practice. Um, I have gotten to work with video game companies and, and others related to that industry, which is, of course, who doesn't love video games? I'm, I'm, I'm stereotypical male in that respect. Um, right. So it's been a lot of fun. You have to yeah, have the well, best tax write-offs. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yes, you do. It's for research purposes. I needed these games. <laughs> I needed these surfboards. <laughs> and yes, and I need an echo look, as we will discuss later in the show. <laughs> it is purely for research. Um, let's move on into uh, some of the great stories uh, that we have this week. Let's start out in the realm of uh, entertainment and Hollywood. stuck this under entertainment in Hollywood because I'm not quite sure. It certainly relates to entertainment. I'm not sure if it's, um, if there is any kind of intellectual property overtone here, but we can, we can sort of suss that out in a moment. There might be privacy overtones here too, or maybe it's just a great service. So I'm interested um, in what you guys think about this, but if you are the proud owner of a Roku TV, and I have one of those things, but I don't think it has yet uh, updated its software to the point where it can do what this one, uh, what this article is discussing. Um, and that is, it has a feature now called more ways to watch. This is only available if you have a Roku TV itself, if you just have a Roku box. Um, this doesn't work with that. I don't know if there are plans to um, make this work with that or if it physically can have all the information that it needs. Um, if you're just using a Roku box, that's not uh, also talking to your cable or satellite box. But what more ways to watch does is it shows you if you're watching some service other than um, a Roku kind of service like Netflix or Amazon Instant Video. If you're just watching your satellite TV or cable TV, actually nothing in this article discusses satellite. I'm just assuming that they can, oh no, it does. Uh, cable, satellite, or antenna. So you're watching um, television programming coming into your TV, not through the Roku services. This Roku TV is going to tell you whether that program can also be streamed using a Roku service like Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Video. Um, so on the one hand, um, that's very helpful, I, I would imagine, for all of those services. And I'm, I'm wondering what the business arrangements are around this. Um, it, it would tend to drive you away from using your conventional television programming service and go, oh, I could also watch that uh, if I wanted to start from the beginning of the show and I've come in the middle, for example, I could catch it on Netflix and then you might switch over. Um, so I think this is a, a super interesting and useful technology. It's a little bit, uh, I'm sure, high on the creep factor as it is going to need to be paying attention to what you're watching in order to cue you that, hey, you could also see it on Netflix and, and you know, discussing how that data is used or stored uh, is probably um, an interesting part of <laughs> the dialogue here. They use a technology called automatic content recognition to recognize what's currently uh, on your cable antenna or satellite programming. Um, again, I think super interesting. Um, need to know, and I don't think we do know yet um, about the data issues related to this practice. Um, and also I, I'm interested in whether the TV programmers or the cable system, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are gonna call foul on this and say, hey, you're diverting customers away from our service and we don't like it and we have some legal basis to try and stop you. And maybe that's intellectual property, I'm not sure. Sean, what do you think about all this? 
Uh, well, I think the biggest issue that these guys are going to face is uh, more or less a PR campaign, right? So they're they're doing mm-hmm. something that maybe isn't necessarily technically wrong or legally wrong, but what they're doing is uh, letting their customers know that we are watching everything that you're doing and we're keeping track of everything we're doing. We're collecting all that data. And I, I think there in recent years has been a little bit more awareness among the general population that uh, of all the different data that's being collected about us through Facebook, through Google, through our even our email accounts. Um, and the biggest hurdle then for Roku would be, uh, will customers care enough to stop using the service? And if, if that's not the case, then what, what's really to stop them? Uh, from an intellectual property perspective, I think the the closest thing I can think of would be uh, there was that service a number of years ago that was shut down. It was a Supreme Court case on this, and you'll, maybe you'll remember the name of the service, but they it took antennas. What was it? Aerial. Aerial. That's right. Yeah, Aerial. Um, so they took an antenna and put an antenna, one antenna per customer on top of a, a building somewhere. And they were trying to get around the whole rebroadcast thing by having uh, the, like I said, one antenna per customer. So it wasn't broadcasting back out to a whole group of people. But there, there was a rebroadcast. Here, Roku is just identifying content. They're not identifying the content and then rebroadcasting. They may be encouraging somebody to rebroadcast or encouraging you to go to Netflix. Um, but that seems then more like something that would bother the cable companies to the point of finding some reason to go after Roku, but maybe that's not the exact reason. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't really see where the intellectual property, uh, thing comes into play, but I can see why they might be annoying cable companies and might be bothering their customer base by collecting all this data. Yeah. On both fronts. Um, I do think uh, there's a way they could do this service on the on the data point, on the privacy creepiness point. Um, I think there's a way they could probably do it uh, without, st- you know, do, would they really need to store the data? They could monitor in real time and give you alerts and then just dump the data. And customers mm-hmm. might feel better if they knew that that's the way it was working. And maybe that is the right. way it's working. I just don't know um, enough about how it works yet. But yeah, on the on the um, diverting customers away from uh, the cable system or the satellite system issue, I, I don't know how they would necessarily go about disrupting that or or complaining about that. Um, it reminds me a little bit too, not just of the Aereo case that you brought up, but of um, uh, the cases involving uh, commercial skipping. There, there you have a more clear intellectual property, property claim, claim because you're making copies and then skipping through uh, part of the copy and actually altering the copy from the way that it would be shown to customers mm-hmm. if it hadn't, you know, without the skipping. Um, so that, that was never tested in court. Uh, there was a huge settlement about that. And now I can't remember the name of... Um, Replay TV, that was it, <laughs> a long, long time ago, probably before both of you were paying attention. <laughs> but <laughs> that, that was in a, an early uh, tussle along the, those lines. And then um, TiVo and others have, have fought that battle since. Um, so just think it's super interesting and something to keep an eye on. Uh, Matt, anything to add? Yeah, I think that there is language in the Aereo decision, and I, I thought Aereo was generally a terrible decision for this reason, in that they said that the the Copyright Act was built in place to protect the um, the cable company, and that's partially why, although Aereo's the Aereo built their decision to be in compliance and they weren't making public performances, that because it was taking away from the business, then therefore uh, it was this they kind of stepped away from the technology of it and said, well, this is um, this is this is getting away from the point of the copyright law, and therefore we're going to step it back. So if if we're still going to apply that logic, um, I think it gets harder and harder as technology moves in, into a direction where cable isn't really cable. You know, when when your when your services are on demand, you're streaming and all of that. Uh, I think it gets harder to do that logic, but I don't know what the Supreme Court will do with that. As far as the uh, Roku news. I, I, from what I read about it, I thought they did a great job of making this an opt-in thing. So they didn't just shove it down their customers' throats and make it a um, a baseline assumption. It, it sounded to me like you had to you had to opt into this. I, I don't know if that's mm-hmm. if that's what's clear. 
you know, yeah. if I could chime in, I'll, I'll make the point that I buy into all these things. I, I I don't care so much about a lot of the data that's being collected about me because I, I try to keep a generally clean footprint on the internet. But um, I, you know, I don't care if Roku knows what I'm watching. I just don't. Uh, and, and maybe other people do, but it seems like a lot of um, a lot of the public cares about data collection for the sake of caring instead of um, looking at what data is being collected and whether it actually matters to them. Though I do understand that there are certainly issues about like your Facebook page being mined. Um, but uh, when it comes to what I'm watching on television, I just don't care. So you know, maybe other people see it the way I do. Maybe they don't. Yeah, I think a lot of people would care. Uh, if there were, if they uh, knew that their television viewing habits were being stored and sold, um, I think people would would not. Uh, but do feel those great same people that. still put in their phone number when they go to Ralph's or the grocery store? Because when you're doing that, <laughs> you're giving it's the same data. You're you're giving data on what you buy, your purchasing habits, when you purchase mm -hmm. things. That that's been going on for decades, and nobody seems to really. There's never no outcry about that. Um, so what, what is the functional difference between a grocery store getting your phone number so you can get a discount and collecting all the data about your purchases versus Roku going out and getting a little bit of information about what television shows you like? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, it, and I do think that people, you know, when they know they're getting a discount on their grocery bill, that's, that's something concrete that uh, makes them sure. prob probably fall asleep about the privacy <laughs> implications. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just another way in which um, we're all being diced up and bought and sold. <laughs> but again, uh, th uh, this kind of service though, as we sort of live in this gray area between um, cord cutters and non-cord cutters. I mean, certainly there are people who just don't have a relationship with their cable or satellite provider uh, anymore because all of the rest of the services um, have supplanted that for them. But there are a lot, a lot of people who live in this kind of gray area where, yeah, I do Netflix for one thing and I watch, um, I keep my satellite TV because perhaps I love live sports or whatever. And uh, so they've kind of got this smorgasbord of services that they're paying for if they can afford to do that. Um, and it's, I find myself, we, we find ourselves in that boat uh, here in my household. And I do find myself um, shopping between them. And, and it would be nice to have some indication of, oh, what I'm watching right now on one channel is also available on in these others. And maybe ultimately it would be a cue for people that, oh, if I can get enough of the things that I watch on these other services, maybe I can dump one. Um, yeah. I, al I also find that uh, uh, if you're gonna watch a movie, I wind up looking three or four places to find out, you know, okay, where am I going to get the longest rental for the lowest price kind of thing? Cause they all have slightly different terms that they offer. Um, maybe not a lot of people care about saving that buck or two, <laughs> but um, I think that uh, I'm probably not alone in that. Anyway, let's uh, move on to our other entertainment related story. Uh, which um, you probably, if you're watching your satellite or cable television, ad supported television, you've probably noticed that Domino's Pizza has been doing these homage to Ferris Bueller commercials. Um, there's one, one longer piece that uh, I think is exclusively online and they've done some shorter pieces for television. We'll I think we have one of those queued up for you now. So just in case you haven't seen it, you can know what we're talking about here. How could I possibly be expected to go without Domino's on a day like this? Uh, I'll ask Domino's to place my easy order. Ordering Domino's. Life moves pretty fast. If you can't track your pizza, you could miss it. Order two medium, two topping pizzas for just five. Okay, thanks, Victor. So you can see that the, in there and in the longer piece um, that's available online too, uh, it's very much, by the way, speaking of Netflix, I understand the actor there is a Stranger Things star that will um, be familiar to many, many people. Uh, so they're sort of updating Ferris Bueller in a lot of ways. And uh, one of the things that went off in my mind, a couple of things went off in my mind when I started to see these around. Number one, is 
wow, okay, we've got music, we've got quotes, we've got, you know, contexts that are clearly supposed to invoke this movie, and yet they're not referring to the movie, they're not referring um, to the characters by name. So I wondered if perhaps Domino's was trying to walk a thin line of not actually licensing anything from the movie in the course of making this commercial. Um, in the course of looking into this a little deeper, uh, it appears that they did not try and walk that line. Uh, Domino's, here's from the Ad Age article that we have in the rundown. Domino's said its campaign was created under license from Paramount Pictures. The chain was allowed to recreate sequences from the John Hughes film as long as it followed one rule. It could not use the words Ferris Bueller. Um, so that with that license in place, they had pretty free reign to make you Think of Ferris Bueller as you were um, considering whether you needed to track your pizza. Uh, but this is not the only instance of a brand or trying to um, use nostalgia uh, to sell something current. And I don't know that in every instance that I'm seeing this uh, recently uh, that the licensing T's have been dotted and I's have been crossed. I just, I feel like this is a trend and that we're gonna see more um, legal disputes possibly about whether you can pay homage to something uh, without actually getting all the permissions that a lawyer might tell you to get uh, before you run with it. Uh, what did you think of this, Sean? Um, I think, I mean, you've had a very good assessment of it so far. Uh, what this really comes down to is, is it a derivative work? Um, and obviously, uh, they didn't want to take any chances when they made the commercial because they talked to Paramount first. Uh, mm -hmm. But if, if we look at what the elements are, even for a derivative work, you need to have some fixation. You need to incorporate some of the original material. Um, and then you need to have some level of originality or uh, transformation of that work so that it's a new thing. Um, and this really does, uh, I think, satisfy all of those elements, at least um, uh, at a cursory glance, uh, because it, it's very clearly uh, taking off from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And But it also is sufficiently original from the old one. They changed some of the settings. The actor's different. Uh, a whole handful of other things are, are different about it, but it's still recognizably a Ferris Bueller thing. So it's mm -hmm. a derivative work in that sense, which, which means uh, Paramount would own the, the exclusive right to create any derivative work. So, of course, they needed to go get a license. Domino's needed to go get a license before doing this. Um, and so I think they did the right thing by doing all that. Um, and it does bring up some interesting uh, copyright issues. Uh, and, and certainly by getting this license, Anybody in the future who wants to go out and recreate shot for shot some scene in a movie, now the owner of that movie has something concrete to point to to say, well, look, uh, Paramount got a license for that, so you need a license from us to do that, uh, to do, do something similar. So it's in that sense, it's uh, setting the groundwork for future spinoffs like this for, for advertising. Your hypothesis was that they went and talked to Paramount first. Mine is that, <laughs> and I, again, point. I have... I have no basis for saying this, but my guess just from the way that the commercials kind of walk the line is that maybe they were flirting with not getting a license. Um, the, the, because I think an argument could be made that they, you know, may, they probably added some elements once they had the license that, again, this is just a guess, uh, that may not have been there um, in the first place. But I think an argument could be made that you could make a commercial like this without one. So yeah, I think you're right, Sean, that that lawyers would say, hey, you know, Domino's went to Paramount, you you really need to license this from us. But um, somebody who wanted to be bold and adventuresome and precedent setting might try something like this without that licensing. Sean, too, I wanted to ask, since you do some trademark work, do you think that something like this not just implicates copyrights, but trademarks? Uh, well, trademark uh, at its core is a consumer protection device. It really is used to indicate to a consumer the source of some goods. Um, so they didn't use the words Ferris Bueller, which may or may not have some trademark registered. I have no idea. Um, but the the thing that they're selling is Domino's Pizza. And so the Domino's mark is what predominantly appears in this advertisement. 
and it's used in association with selling pizza. So uh, the, really what we look for when we're talking about a trademark issue is whether a mark is being used um, by a company or entity that doesn't own that mark to promote or sell its own goods or services. And I really don't see that here. I think they've done everything right as far as uh, trademark is concerned. But if we had seen, for example, and this is maybe why Paramount said don't use Ferris Bueller, if they had said uh, Domino's new Ferris Bueller uh, pizza topping, whatever, um, and tried to use that uh, in the sense of selling goods or selling pizza in this case, then there's an issue. But since they didn't and they stuck to their own mark and they stayed away from the Ferris Bueller mark, um, it really only implicates copyright law as far as I can see it. Right. Uh, any further th shots? Uh, shots. Any shots you want to take at this, Matt? Uh, no, I, I love when people mention Ferris Bueller. Uh, I, I could not see myself using the service, but I think you guys nailed the IP angle on this. All right. You don't want to regale us with Donka Shane before we move on? And I thought about it, and then I thought, uh, wised up a little bit. All right. All right. Uh, we'll make our first MCLE passphrase for the show. Bueller. Bueller. <laughs> <laughs> um, just for uh, anyone who may be listening for MCLE credit, uh, that's mandatory continuing legal education or any other kind of professional education credit. We know we have some folks who um, watch the show and then submit the required forms to their professional oversight body because uh, they're not just playing along with us for fun, but we actually talk about useful things that you might need to know on this show. Uh, and keep you current on legal developments. So if you want more information about that, hit, head on over to wiki.twit.tv, find our This Week in Law page there, and you'll find a breakdown of all 50 of the United States and how what forms that you would need to submit uh, to ask for credit in your jurisdiction if you're a lawyer uh, for playing along with us here on the show. Uh, if you're having uh, any issues with that, let us know. I certainly am happy to shoot people off uh, any additional forms or information that you need to make that happen. Uh, but uh, we- Do I get credit for participating? <laughs> if you submit the proper forms and pay the proper fees, we're not a pr an approved <laughs> provider. Yeah. That is <laughs> That is a complicated process and it it kind of, you know, I've thought about going through the process and have gotten partway through the process in California, and it might be worthwhile just to do that. I think there are some states that will waive you in if California is, you know, where it happened. But it's too big a process to try and do it in all the jurisdictions that people would need. Um, so I, I just kind of let people um, do it on their own. Or certainly you know, the fees involved, for example, if you spend $25 in California, that's what the bar will charge you to file the requisite form. And that's a lot less than a lot of MCLE courses out there. So, you know, just one thing that we add as a possible thing you might do with the show. And some jurisdictions actually need you to have these phrases uh, in there so you can show you watched or listened instead of just um, sticking it down on a list somewhere. So that's why we put these phrases in. We'll put another one in uh, before the end of the show. And the first one is Bueller. Bueller. Also, I put them in because it's kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> to pull out part of the show that is worthy, phrase worthy. Um, let's move on uh, to, um, but we've already touched on some privacy issues today about Netflix. Uh, let's talk about some other ones. I uh, don't know if uh, people have been seeing Unroll Me have a uh, privacy flack. Um, Unroll Me, part of a company bought by a company called Slice Intelligence, uh, a data firm that um, used Unroll Me, which it purchased, to scan people's uh, email inboxes for information. Um, and then it used some of that information uh, to help out its customers. It was, um, I didn't use it, so I'm not quite sure how it worked. If it was an extension that somehow communicated with your email inbox, that's what my assumption is. Um, but what it, it's a hook for consumers was that it would go through your email inbox and find things that you were subscribed to, that you were getting uh, in email, and it would give you the option to unsubscribe to those things. So you'd get less 
spam or less things that you were no longer interested in subscribing to. Uh, personally, for me, I just send things I don't want to see to the spam folder. And, and it turns out that that is um, a better approach than using Unroll Me in this particular case, because uh, in addition to providing this service, Unroll Me was also um, data mining people's email inboxes and selling that information. Uh, Unroll Me is not the only company out there doing it. And Unroll Me actually um, had in its privacy policy, if anybody had bothered to look, uh, the fact that it disclosed the fact that it was going to collect, use, transfer, sell, and disclose non-personal information for any purpose. Um, and again, we get into, we've had so many discussions lately about non-personal, non-identifiable, anonymized information and whether what those terms actually mean in today's day and age. Um, and uh, Unroll Me went on to say that that data would be used to build anonymous market research products and services. Um, so on the disclosure front, they probably did everything they needed to do legally, but that doesn't mean its customers were happy and they, in fact, were not happy at all. Um, so Enroll Me has been, and, and in fact, uh, it's sort of guilt by association, uh, the way this came to light was that Uber was doing some um, investigative uh, competition strategy intelligence gathering about Lyft and uh, getting information from people's inboxes about um, whether they were Lyft users and what sort of usage they had of Lyft, et cetera. So um, uh, kind of icky on all fronts, uh, including the fact that it really doesn't appear that under the law, um, people have anything to complain about vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis Unroll Me. Um, as, as our law now stands, Unroll Me disclosed its practices uh, maybe somebody could make some hay over whether they, in fact, were disclosing personally identifiable information or not. They said they were not, but um, again, I think that's becoming harder and harder to demonstrate. Um, so uh, a good object lesson, I think, on both sides of the equation. Number one, um, Unroll Me certainly did not want to be in the position of being the bad guy here. Um, and could have done more to advise its users uh, other than just having a few lines in its um, privacy policy, which nobody reads, uh, what was being done with their data. And on the user side, the response to this whole flap uh, seems to have been, hey, you know, it's free service. Uh, you've got to be aware that when you're subscribing to things like this for free, um, even if they're doing some sort of... Uh, nominatively useful, arguably privacy enhancing service for you by unsubscribing you from things that you don't want, that doesn't mean it's not gonna violate your privacy down the road. Um, and again, maybe uh, your spam filter, spam folder might be a better way to tackle that issue. Uh, Matt, what did you think about Unroll Me and its uh, Uber related issues? Yeah, I think it's um, it's icky. I I don't know if there's any you know kind of what you broke down the the legal angle of of getting any sort of re remedy for this is I don't think it's there. Um, I think it just feels particularly nasty because they are like you said they are that company that's going in there to clean out your services um, and that they're selling your data is is pretty bad. Um, I don't I also don't think this is good for Uber. Um, I think they tend to get in trouble with these sort of cutting the line sort of things, and that's part of their corporate culture, and that's uh, you know that's part of what's made them successful. That's also why they end up in the news so much. Right, Sean. Uh, anything you want to say in Uber's or Unroll Me's defense here? Well, on the subject of Unroll Me, uh, similar to what we were talking about with the Roku thing earlier, it seems to me it's a PR thing, right? They they mm -hmm. seem to have dotted their I's and crossed their T's from a legal perspective. But the real difference between uh, Roku and Unroll Me was Roku was pretty direct or upfront about what they're doing. It's a surface level thing where you can see that, okay, it's suggesting some Netflix thing, so obviously it's seeing what I'm doing. 
In this case, Unroll Me ostensibly is a service that's designed to uh, help you maintain privacy. You're trying to get off of subscriber lists. You're trying to scrape yourself away from some of these things on the internet. And then instead they turn around and sell all your data. Um, so uh, while they may have done nothing legally wrong, they're certainly getting busted in the, the court of public opinion. Um, so I, I'm glad that that sort of thing comes to the surface because I certainly wouldn't want to use a surface like that where when I'm trying to get myself away from these different uh, email lists, it's just bundling it up and selling more data away to somebody else. I, I don't I don't care for that. So. Uh, right. While I, I, I don't care at all what Roku does with my data, I would care about something like that. Um, and to uh, a broader point about, sure, they may have dotted their I's and crossed their T's, but uh, I read somewhere recently, which this is now purely anecdotal because I can't remember my source at all, but if uh, someone were to read every uh, terms of use or privacy policy statement that they agree to in a year, uh, <laughs> they'd spend something like 70 business days reading. <laughs> um, that doesn't it doesn't work. You, nobody can do that. So, but what, yeah. what's the solution? I have no idea what the solution to that is. Um, outside of uh, requiring everyone to have a bullet point of the top three most nefarious things they're doing in their privacy policy statements, uh, put up at the front so users can see what it is. Um, but that's just just not that's not a tenable solution. So, uh, I don't know how to fix it. But certainly, um, I'm glad to see that uh, services like Unroll Me are uh, you know getting their comeuppance in this in this sense when when people find out what they're doing. Right. Uh, we've been talking about these issues a lot on the show lately, Sean, in the context of uh, the FCC and the rules that were to go into effect this year regarding ISPs that did not um, and the data collection and selling practices um, that they may engage in and how people can opt out of them. Um, we've been looking at privacy policies of the various ISPs and trying to point people toward how they can opt out of data collection and selling, you know, to the extent that they can. Um, and some of that discussion has involved, okay, so the FCC is not going to do this. Um, the FTC is the more appropriate body to do things like this. Anyway, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, but specifically <coughs> on this um, unroll me point and on uh, the personal data market in general that companies like Slice are in, uh, the New York Times points out that in 2014, uh, the FTC wanted Congress to protect consumers against unchecked collection and marketing of their data. There was an FTC report that was filed that detailed how some of these companies classify consumers in data-driven social and demographic groups uh, with names like financially challenged, diabetes interest, and smoker in the household. Um, the FTC was concerned that such classifications could be used to limit fair access to financial services or health insurance. Uh, the Obama administration actually endorsed that FTC recommendation, but it was never taken up by Congress, so um, nothing ever came of that 2014 report. And instead, um, things seem to be heading the opposite direction uh, with the um, <coughs> recent FCC uh, rule that was enacted last fall and then rolled back. Um, so uh, something, you, you said something about, uh, what do we do about this? Well, <laughs> I guess that was one thing they tried to do yeah. about this, <laughs> didn't quite work. Um, do you think in general that that the marketplace is the best place to um, police these kinds of things, uh, to, to bring pressure to bear on companies like Unroll Me and others that see the fallout from this because the customers are unhappy? Um, do you think that's enough or do we need regulation to come down on data brokers and um, govern how they manage and disclose things? Boy, that's tricky. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly the court of public opinion has proved itself to be strong, but when you come down to services that everybody uses and everybody considers, let's say, um, or, or they're unwilling to give up, Facebook, a uh, great mm -hmm. example. Um, they could do all sorts of things with your data. It's written in the terms of service. They're not doing anything wrong with that, but people could still be uncomfortable, and plenty of people are uncomfortable with how their data is being used by Facebook. Uh, it's easy enough for someone to say, well, I'm not going to use Unroll Me anymore because it's a small service. I see those more as the little cash grab companies that pop up, create some really cool service that um, 
uh, ultimately ends up uh, being detrimental to the user in a, in a way that they're not willing to accept. But with Facebook, people are more or less willing to accept that um, that's the way it is. So a new regulatory scheme or updated regulatory scheme that adds a little bit more consumer protection may not be a bad idea in the sense of these bigger companies, but um, I it seems to be the case that a lot of these smaller cash grab startups are really struggling to get footing once people figure out what the heck it is they're doing. Um, and there thankfully seem to be quite a few people who are acting as watchdogs for these sort of things. Um, so uh, as much as I, I hesitate to say that we need additional regulation on something like terms of service and terms of use, because it's hard enough to start up a small company anyway without making sure you comply with uh, obscure terms of use um, requirements. Um, so, but, but on the other hand, there are these big companies like the Facebooks and the Googles of the world that maybe could use a little bit more regulatory oversight. Um, but that comes down then to politics and which I am not an expert on. Um, <laughs> so yeah, well, I, I kind of leave it open ended right there. Okay. Matt, anything you want to add? Yeah, I, I sort of think it, I, I'm fairly libertarian, but I, I think that this is one of the things, this is like kind of like the statute of frauds. Like you can't get married without having explicit, um, terms you can't sell your land without uh, an explicit contract and, and privacy seems like one of those things that rises to the level that you know we're going to make you specifically opt in for these things um, mm -hmm. I wish Congress would have acted I, I wish they would I, I, I'm not an expert in politics but I, I don't have much hope all right well we'll we'll try and be hopeful regardless <laughs> and we'll keep letting you know about uh, things like enroll me and and whether um, they're on the right side or the wrong side as, of the law as it stands. Now, uh, along those lines, let's uh, take a journey out of terms of service that exist only online and into things that might be implementing them. I have real mixed emotions about the Echo look. Um, on the one hand, uh, to the extent I want to try it out and uh, give it a whirl, um, as we were talking at the beginning of the show, I'm glad that I practice in the areas that I do and can pick one up and call it research because uh, it <laughs> most certainly is. Um, on the other hand, I am not at all sure that uh, I need... Uh, Amazon having photographs of me and my various uh, outfit outfit uh, choices or potential outfit choices and gathering AI about uh, how I make those decisions. And uh, uh, let me just take a step back and say that whoever decided to put a camera on an Echo for any reason really deserves their role in the dystopian fiction Hall of Fame. <laughs> and Agreed. Yes, and and now that we we see this um, coming to pass, we certainly need to think about you know what other camera-driven personal assistant tasks uh, you can come up with and what they might do. Um, the, uh, the Verge, uh, James Vincent at The Verge has a piece called Amazon's Echo Look is a minefield of AI and privacy concerns. Really, you think? Uh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely it is. Um, and they went one step further and tried to get um, some clarity from Amazon about what they will do with the data gathered from the Echo Look. Uh, a representative from Amazon told The Verge uh, that at this point, the look will only use machine learning to analyze users' fashion choices. But when asked if this might change in the future, they said they can't speculate on the topic. <laughs> the representative stressed that users can delete videos and photos taken by the look at any time, but until they do, it seems this content will be stored indefinitely on Amazon's servers. Um, so, you know, once again, I'm sort of uh, back in your boat, Sean. There, there are some things that I care about data-wise. There are other things that I don't care about. There are trade-offs I'm willing to make. Um, 
you know, I don't know that I'm such a fashionista that I need to get to, to double check with Amazon and its AI before I get myself dressed in the morning. I just think this would be kind of fun to play with um, and see what it does and see, you know, how it's privacy uh, practices are disclosed or not and whether it's hard to delete things from the device or not. So I definitely put myself on the list to try and get one. Uh, don't have one in hand yet, but I um, think it will be a kick to play around with. Uh, what do you think, Sean? Oh, man. Um, I'm just astonished that somebody has made a consumer electronic device that has a better sense of fashion than I do. Well, not that that's a high <laughs> compliment, but <laughs> boy, could I use one of these. Um, I, I am utterly clueless, generally speaking, when it comes to, to style and fashion. I have to have other people tell me. So from that perspective, how cool is this? But you also have to understand that when you buy something that's branded with uh, Amazon, Amazon is in the business of selling you things. They're in the business of knowing as much about you as possible so they can put the right thing in front of your face at the right time so that you'll click buy now. Um, so mm -hmm. if they're collecting all these different images of you wearing different outfits and they're learning your style, they're learning uh, what brands you wear, they're learning what colors you like, um, all kinds of information can be gathered from from a picture. Um, and there is all sorts of image recognition software that's improving all the time that's getting better and better at identifying uh, if you're actually wearing a jacket, knowing what that brand is and, and how much it costs and whether they can undercut you and so on and so forth. That's And maybe that's just speculation about where the future of this stuff, but it would not in the least bit surprise me if this is another massive information gathering um, endeavor. Um, and it, I, I don't know enough to say if they have some opt-in, opt-out, or or what their current policy is. But um, Denise, like you said, uh, is this something that I care about? No, because if Amazon does know what I want to buy and they're willing to put the right shirt in front of me at the right time, yeah, I'll probably buy it. Um, I, don't, I don't really care. Um, I, I don't want Amazon knowing my social security number. I don't want them knowing uh, some other information about me for sure, but knowing what clothes I like, sure, have at it. Um, it seems like a pretty useful, cool tool. The other thing that's kind of funny about this uh, to distinguish it from something like Enroll Me or other free services is the device is 200 bucks. Yeah, it's for, incredible. You know, all the, all the data that you're forking over to Amazon for it to dice and slice and try and sell you just the right jacket for your outfit or what have you. Um, it, that's a lot of money to pay for the privilege of them having your data and being able to sell you things. Uh, and, and certainly maybe that would shift over time, but um, I just think it's, it's kind of uh, ballsy <laughs> on Amazon's oh, part to it say, is. yeah. <laughs> We're gonna. We're not only are we gonna know so much about you, but you're gonna pay dearly for that process. Again, uh, dystopian fiction hall of fame. <laughs> what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I, I, I'm still amazed that people have the Echo in their house. So um, this is just beyond the realm for me. I, I do think it'll really raise interesting questions as they've raised in um, with the Echo about whether. Uh, there was that murder case where they were trying to get the information. Um, when you talk about facial image recognition, you know, is is the government going to be able to get the picture of your face? Um, not that they already don't have one, or but are they going to be able to use those unique characteristics to identify you? And when are we likely to see this in court? So uh, I think it'll be fun to watch. Uh, you will not see one in my house, though. <laughs> that's that's good to know. Yeah, we we do have the echo and. Uh, we have one that is not constantly recording. It has um, the button that you have to push in order for it to be listening to you. Um, and then we have one of the conventional ones. But I do, you know, I, we've talked about this on the show before. Um, I don't have a, a standard practice of having strangers in the house, I guess, of telling them, hey, by the way, before you say anything incriminating, there's an echo on the counter. Uh, but I kind of <laughs> feel like... Kind of feel like I might need to have that kind of standard practice at some point. Um, let's just mention, too, since I haven't mentioned it already in the show, we've been talking about um, a lot of the great writing and research and reporting uh, that has caught our eye in the last week 
um, to as interesting things to discuss here on our show. And if you'd like to read all of the things that we look at in getting ready for the show, we have two places that you can do that. We have a Flipboard magazine. I am D Howell on Flipboard. And logically enough, the magazine that we put all the links into for the show is called This Week in Law. So if Flipboard is your thing, you can find it there. Uh, we also use a service called Tagpacker, which is a bookmarking service uh, that I'm finding to be quite nice for show organizational purposes. It's uh, my account there is at tagpacker.com slash user slash this week in law. And we organize everything by show number. So if you look for episode 384, you'll find all the links to everything we've discussed in today's show. Uh, let's move on to in this internet of things living in the future kind of world and uh, point out that if you're dying to take uh, an Uber flying taxi somewhere, um, you're going to want to put on your calendar uh, the year 2020, uh, possibly as late as 2023. <laughs> uh, they're going to be tested in 2020. And uh, you're going to want to get yourself to um, either Dubai or Dallas, Fort Worth. Uh, we've talked about uh, Dubai being uh, an area that was uh, receptive to having flying taxis in the air. Uh, but you can add Dallas to that list as well. Um, and uh, the the uh, Dubai ones, uh, completely apart from Uber, are going to start um, flying uh, this July uh, by a Chinese drone maker named Yi Hang. Um, so Dubai is uh, hoping to be the world leader in flying taxis. Uh, as we've pointed out before, the ones that uh, Dubai has approved are not self-driving flying taxis. They're actually, they're remotely piloted, but they are piloted. Uh, they are not making <laughs> autonomous decisions for themselves, which I think at this stage of the game is a good thing for a flying taxi. Um but uh, I'm not. I don't know, man. Sure. I kind of want my pilot yeah. to have a skin in the game, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you want them in the in the taxi with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Whoopsie, that yeah, one crashed. Be somebody in my cab. He's be sitting next to me. Otherwise, you know, whatever. I, for all I know, he's sipping a beer in some room somewhere. Yeah, I don't know the the whole uh, FAA um, air traffic control regulations. Uh, what did you buy? Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. It seems like having skin in the game could be a good idea. Uh, anyway, so these are these are coming to um, cities near you, most notably Dubai and Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth. Um, if Uber can keep it together long enough to <laughs> get its testing and its flying taxis underway. My husband was completely skeptical skeptical of all this, thinks that it's all uh, pie in the sky. And he'll believe it when he sees it. Um, how do you feel about it, Matt? Uh, I think that autonomous flying is really exciting. Um, I will not be the first user, though. That's that's how I feel about it. <laughs> but again, do, what's your uh, take on uh, Sean's point that uh, these aren't autonomous? There's no one in the car with you, but they are being flown for you by a human. Yeah, yeah. I will. I will. I think that that. Um, I mean, I agree with the the joking point, and I think it's a real point that <laughs> it's nice to have someone with the skin of the game. Um, but uh, I, I think that when they get to autonomous, I think that's a, a far better system um, in terms of flying. Like most of flight is already done, uh, more or less computerized. So I, I think we're really not that far away. Um, I think they need to set conditions on in, in a place like Dallas or a place like uh, Dubai makes sense because you know you you pretty much know when the weather conditions are coming up. They they have uh, you know pretty far radar and it's not like living in the Midwest where it changes every five minutes. Um, so I I think that those are great test spots um, and I'm really excited to watch how this develops. Yep, us too. That's why we're bringing it up on the show. Uh, anybody have more information about uh, testing of flying taxis or flying ta taxi technology? Um, please uh, keep us in the loop because we think it's fascinating. Uh, also fascinating, you uh, mentioned earlier, Matt, the case that we discussed on the show before about using Alexa data in the course of a murder investigation. Um, it can't have been too long and it wasn't 
too long um, until another sort of internet connected internet of things related device was also uh, brought into a murder investigation. This time it is a murdered woman's Fitbit. Uh, her husband is being charged uh, or at least being investigated um, in connection with her murder and uh, the Fitbit's data is being uh, called upon to help create the timeline of what uh, happened with her that night. Um, so uh, again, you can read more about this one at CNN. Uh, this has been uh, much reported there. Um, so the timeline apparently doesn't make much sense with the husband's story. And if the, I think what um, uh, prosecutors are hoping to demonstrate is that um, the Fitbit demonstrates uh, that she was actually walking around and still alive uh, when the husband thought otherwise. So um, it could wind up um, impeaching whatever evidence that he gives and um, making his story seem not credible or, or poking huge holes in it. So um, between smart water meters, echoes, uh, personal fitness monitors, uh, last year in Ohio, apparently investigators used evidence retrieved from a pacemaker to build an arson case. Uh, evidence from things is becoming definitely a thing. Any thought about this, Sean? Um, well, this is just one of those signs that we really do live in the future, right? Um, that and a little <laughs> button in my bathroom to get more toilet paper. I mean, there's all kinds <laughs> of cool stuff, Do you have stuff, a dash right? button it, for toilet paper? Yeah, ranging yeah. from the, the single button to buy a single item from Amazon and have it delivered to your doorstep in two days or the next day to collecting information about murders from Fitbits. Uh, I think that's impossibly cool. Um uh, I don't see really any downside to that sort of investigation, though I'm sure people far more creative than myself are able to see why this is a bad thing, but it hasn't been explained to me yet. Um, and uh, the fact that we have all this data available is just endlessly fascinating. Um, and also, I think there's a, a lot of uh, potential to do good. Um, if you are wrongly accused of something and you had your Fitbit on and it has a GPS and you can show that I, you were indeed somewhere else or you were indeed on your run, um, I mean, that's great. That's great evidence to exonerate. Um, so it's just a, another uh, weapon in the arsenal for prosecutors and also for defense attorneys. So I, I really like that um, th this sort of thing is becoming more commonplace. And and the other shoe dropping on that, of course, is that there will become a maybe underground market for hacking someone's Fitbit, right? To tell a story that perhaps didn't actually happen, shows you sure. want to run when you weren't, that right. kind of thing. Yes. First thing I'm going to do if I murder someone is come up with fake mm -hmm. GPS data, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says Matt, that with such a smile. <laughs> really? Nobody's going to react to that? <laughs> I, I think I'd come out the other way on this. I think that for evidentiary purposes, uh, a Fitbit is, is, is going to be really weak evidence because it's, you know, anyone could be wearing it and, and be able to, uh, you know, it, it's just different, you know, whereas with the Alexa, if they can actually track the voice of the person, therefore, you know, it's uniquely identified to this person um, in the water meter. It's not like you can move the water meter in your house, but I can put a Fitbit on someone else and, and have this. So I, I think that, um, you know, they can use this Fitbit data to get the individual to admit to this, but I don't know if it would stand up in, in trial very well. I, I feel like a, a, a creative attorney can, can work around this one. Yeah, definitely. You could poke holes in the story of how reliability, um, yeah. the uh, how reliable the device was that was gathering the data that's at issue in the case. Uh, as long as we're talking about Fitbits as evidence and living in the future, how about the poor 300 pound night scope robot, security robot that was <laughs> um, patrolling a Silicon Valley shopping center and got beat up 
in the process <laughs> of doing its rounds. This is just terrible. <laughs> the guy apparently was uh, allegedly uh, <laughs> under the influence of alcohol, which I, I'm really glad to hear that a stone cold sober person didn't decide to start taking pot shots at the robot. But um, uh, the man was arrested for his uh, robo assault as the piece uh, by David Kravitz at, uh, at Ars Technica puts it. Um, it uh, th this robot, I guess, um, is is designed to provide security in the parking lot. Uh, it um, can do such things as read 300 license plates a minute and supply 360 degree video streaming. Uh, once it def uh, detects something unusual, it alerts uh, an actual human security guard. And just in case you were worried, I'm really happy that um, David Kravitz throws into his coverage of this. They are not armed, <laughs> these security <laughs> robots. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know, but but they could have helped this one because uh, apparently it, it got uh, punched to the ground, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of impressive if you can knock over a 300 pound robot, maybe um, they're top heavy or something. But anyway, uh, robo assault is officially a thing um, and uh, <laughs> something you can be arrested for. I'd, I'd love to see the police report and, and know if it actually says something about assault or rather property damage. Uh, but I, I did guy. look into that. And it does not yeah? say assault. Yeah. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> that's, what, that's kind of what I was thinking. I was hoping that somebody tried to put personhood on this on this drone. Yep. No, not so much. Um, any thoughts, Sean? Well, clearly the robot was asking for it. I mean, look at the way it was dressed. Um, no, I mean, there, there's... It was there's, completely there's, undressed, in fact. <laughs> that shiny exterior begging for problems. Um, I mean, it's, it, I think it's, uh, you know, probably should destroy oh, other Oh, thank you, Victor. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I... It, Destruction of property, not really a good thing in general. Um, I didn't even know that those things existed. It makes me think of the Fallout games where you're running around and there's uh, defense bots all over the place. I'm glad this one isn't armed. Um, so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> oh, it looks like my video may have frozen. Oh, let's see if we can uh, fix that issue. Um, I... I, I Again, living in the future, I, I we're all laughing at this, but um, this may be the the first time the bots uh, register that uh, humans are perpetrating violence against them, and that that can't be a good thing. Um, I think we're all done with our robots and Internet of Things related stories. So without much further ado, I think we're going to move into the realm of legislation and policy. <laughs> And uh, here's where we get to dive into, uh, no pun intended, last week was all about puns. And we have gone a good <laughs> way into the show with, um, without any rearing their ugly head until just about now. But dive into uh, Sean's surf related expertise. Uh, if we don't need to reconnect to him, Victor, are we good with this video? I'm back, I'm good. You're back, back and better than ever. Uh, perfect. Um, so. One of the things that uh, you pay attention to in the surf realm is um, photography and video of surfers. Uh -huh. And I think this is a really fascinating intersection of the world of drone law and the world of photography and copyright, et cetera, et cetera. We had um, a story that we talked about. It wasn't really a story. It was just something that Danny Sullivan Noted, uh, Danny, who writes Search Engine Watch and is a regular fixture here on our Twit network as a guest. Um, it, it, he lives in uh, my town of Newport Beach, and he frequently is down at the beach and takes amazing pictures at the beach. And uh, like me, he likes to tr play around with technology. And he had a drone that he was flying. This was in uh, June of 2015. Uh, a drone that he was flying over the beach, like many people do. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, we can get into um, <laughs> whether they're running afoul of FAA restrictions. Answer, probably so. <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, we'll let the FAA worry about that. Uh, Danny here was capturing video of surfers 
a whole row of folks um, surfing the break in. You can see uh, the surfers from pretty far away, but he's getting closer and closer. And before too long, we may be able to pick out individual surfers. He's getting lower and lower and they certainly now would be aware of the drone, I would think. They're in their uh, path of surfing. Um, uh, so he's at a public beach over the public ocean. Uh, and uh, he had wondered, he writes, uh, about how people would feel about the drone video. Um, and a surfer asked, uh, came up to him and asked if he had permission of all the surfers to shoot. Um, the person objected to anyone taking any type of pictures and equated using a drone to a pedophile taking pictures of kids. Uh, he'd also been drinking, Danny says, so there's that. Uh, as, far as, we, as far as we know, that he didn't try and knock over any 300-pound drones on, or robots on the way up to chat with Danny. Um, so I, I thought this was super interesting, and that you've probably run into the issue since summer of 2015, Sean, uh, this issue of drones photographing surfers. Um, how the surf world feels about this and whether there's been any kind of convention that people have arrived at. Um, well, there are a whole lot of unspoken conventions when it comes to photography at beaches. Um, it, I mean, there's a lot of, just like you hear about localism among surfers in the water, there's localism among photographers. So uh, leaving the law behind for just a second, um, if you show up at a new beach with your $1,000 camera equipment uh, and you are at a beach where it's generally pretty locals only, you're going to get some guff from other photographers, or you may, or uh, for example, um, I, I have gone on a number of different trips out to the D Channel Islands um, and gone surfing at Santa Rosa Island. And when I was out there, I had a little video camera um, that I took out to uh, what's generally considered a somewhat secret spot in California. And when I took out my video camera to uh, shoot a little bit of video of the waves that day, uh, there were more than one more than one person came to me and told me they better not see that video on the internet. Um, so leaving the law behind, there's a whole lot of pressure just among that community. Um, so then if we add in the aspect of, of law in California, there's, uh, you certainly have a right of publicity. Um, and for professional surfers, at least, uh, they, they, you can't just take a picture of a professional surfer on a wave um, and sell that without having some discussion with them. If it's your average Joe Schmo guy and there's no uh, public interest or there is no public figure involved, uh, then you're probably not running into any of those issues. And, and I may be getting some of this a little bit off. I haven't uh, looked at these rules very closely lately, but um, certainly the convention is these photographers are going to these localized spots because that's where professional surfers are going to get waves. And when they get pictures of those professional surfers, um, that's what they can sell to Surfer Magazine, Surfing Magazine. One of those is defunct now. Um, but any sort of uh, magazine that's in the, the market for purchasing surfing photography, they want to see the professionals. And the, the professionals are out there surfing, and they often will call up photographers to say, hey, I'm going to be at this spot today, come take pictures, because they're going to get a cut, a cut of whatever that is. Um, but when we're talking about a drone flying up over a beach, uh, but one of these things for the right of publicity is generally that it has to be a public figure. And if you can't even recognize the people that are in the water because the drone is so far away, then you're maybe you're not running into that sort of issue. And I think the closest analogy we can make is uh, people filming uh, police officers who are conducting their jobs out in public. Um, if mm -hmm. you're out in public, that's that's for everyone to see, everyone to film. And it's pretty well established now that you can legally film an officer uh, conducting an arrest or, uh, you know, operating, doing his business in whatever way he does his business. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think the same is true for a beach. There's nothing wrong with taking video at a beach. Well, uh, while people may have pressured me not to take video at that spot I was at out on an island, uh, there was nothing legally wrong with what I was doing. There were even some surfers out on the water that were professional or semi-professional. And uh, there's, I'm not going to sell it. I have no intent to use it in any other way than just for making my own home video. Um, mm -hmm. So really, the, the whole issue of drones leaping aside the FAA thing is just how people feel. And that seems to be a lot of uh, the theme today is what people are, or what, what entities, companies, people are all doing uh, while it's 
okay maybe within the letter of certain laws um it does make people feel uncomfortable and and if you're out at the beach with your family and you see a, a drone fly overhead or let's say you're sitting out back on your patio having dinner with your family and a drone flies by that your neighbor's cruising around with, then yeah, you might feel a little weird about that. Maybe there's no no regulation or law or anything saying you can't do it, but it feels off. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me, uh, especially as drones are becoming more popular and the price is dropping way down, uh, to see some sort of uh, regulation about how and where they can be used. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me at all if places like a beach where people aren't wearing much clothing or, or something like that um, is one of the subjects of proposed legislation or new legislation that comes comes through. Right. I think it's a really fascinating um, thing to continue to watch. That It's one of those areas, again, where people's expectations may not um, line up with what other people are doing with technology. And that's why you have um, tensions around it. But uh, it, it may well be, we keep saying leaving the FAA compliance aside, um, it may well be that we, we find, you know, if there is um, somebody who takes umbrage at this, maybe they're not going to leave that aside. Maybe they're going to complain to the FAA and, and that's how they wind up um, making sure that footage of them uh, cannot be used because various um, legal hurdles weren't complied with that should have been complied with. Um, in order to get the footage. And that sort of brings us to um, the more consumer friendly uh, beyond drone racing uh, use of first person view goggles to fly drones. Uh, caught my eye this week that um, DJI, who makes the really popular, really um, fun to use uh, drone, uh, the Phantom, has some goggles now that will control it. It really, the goggles seem to be um, designed to make the drone piloting experience, first of all, much more wow factor because it really um, gives you this first person virtual reality kind of experience. Uh, they also seem to be trying to make it um, a broaden their audience away from the tech drone ph photography geek just to someone who might want to have an interesting uh, experience. Um, well, so these drone companies, yeah. I mean, DJI in particular, they make, they, they made this, uh, drone called the phantom. Um, and mm -hmm. they implemented a lot of, uh, fail safes in them so that the, to make it accessible to just about anybody, what they did was they mm -hmm. added a, a GPS chip to it so that the thing knew where it was. If you flew out of transmission range for your controller, it would fly back. Uh, mm -hmm. If it started running out of batteries, it would automatically fly back. So they made these things really dummy proof. And so uh, the the next step with this uh, the VR headset is to make you feel like you're a miniature pilot sitting on your drone, and that is just so cool. Uh, I, I got right. I had the privilege to go to CES. Um, not this year, but last year, and drones were all over the place. And things like drones with these headsets were all over the place. And how cool is that? It's like playing a real-life video game, um, except you can then take pictures of your neighbors eating dinner. So there's, yeah, there's <laughs> that, that whole and other, other thing. of it. But, but the technology and, is just impossibly yeah. cool. Yeah, so we have the video going. Why don't you give us the audio too, Victor? The DJI goggles are designed for easy FPV flying, providing both seamless control and crystal clear views. So you can see there that... A pair of large, high-quality screens offer... Screen As they're showing the people in this video, sometimes they have the person who has the goggles on holding the remote control and piloting the drone. And sometimes they have someone else doing that. Um, and that's actually significant under the FAA rules because having the actual goggle wearer flying the drone is right out unless you get a specific uh, waiver from the FAA that you can do that. Um, otherwise, <laughs> anybody's going to buy this and not do that. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's my point in bringing it up today. Um, it, it certainly DJI doesn't seem to be making a distinction here. Sometimes they have the uh. goggle wear flying and sometimes they don't. But as far as the FAA is concerned, if you are going to fly using first person view goggles, if you are going to fly anything that's not line of sight, you know, you as the pilot, 
um, you have to have a visual observer and that visual observer has to be able to see the drone. I mean, that's the whole point of the visual observer, which throws into the mix here too. these DJI phantoms, at least, and probably other drones too. Um, I found an article that tested one out. Uh, they wanted to see what its maximum range could be. And they were getting four plus miles out of the thing. It was flying and sending back video from 4.2 miles away from where wow. the pilot was standing. Yeah. So line of sight doesn't happen <laughs> in that kind of scenario. Um, and uh, so apparently, despite you know the marketing that we're seeing here and the technology that's available, as far as the FAA is concerned, operators are supposed to limit their flights to only line of sight uh, or you're supposed to have a visual observer and they're supposed to keep the thing in line of sight. Um, so again, this is just sort of another example of, uh, we saw this in the drone racing world where uh, they were gonna have to figure out how they were in compliance with FAA rules. And now, you know, as this kind of technology, as you say, Sean, is more and more marketed to the consumer, so is everybody else. Um, right. So something to watch. Uh, any thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to over the next 10 years. I think that there's real um, – I've seen some initiatives for actually mapping out um, uh, on GPS coordinates where uh, property lines are, specifically around uh, airports and um, you know to build in a, a backdoor map that actually restricts you from going into these areas. I think that's technologically feasible over the next 10 years, and I think that – um, in terms of maximizing privacy and, and, and yet allowing individuals to to travel certain areas with their drones, I, I think that you know futuristically looking in the next five ten years, I think that's the way to go. So let me, yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. We've I know we've talked about this um, before on the show, uh, sort of these virtual uh, barriers for drones. So the way you're envisioning things working is you would, t uh, you know, take off with your drone and your drone, like Sean was saying. Um, it has some various automation built into it, some self-piloting um, features. If it encountered a geofence, it would just go around it. It would go around it or go back to the to the user. I think that mm -hmm. I mean people like like we were just talking about. People want to use these more than the line of sights, and the technology is going to be able to go further. Um, you have to have these sort of geofencing if if you're going to move the technology in a safe way. Um, and and something that restricts boundary lines. Um, we've got a bunch of nuclear power or two nuclear power plants around here. Um, we can't have drones around there. Uh, you know, and, and they already do this with um, you know when we have a football game at Notre Dame. You know, there's a thousand mile radius. I think that this is something that would allow local areas to put in uh, restrictions. And I think this applies to surfing too. Um, if a local community wants to pass a zoning ordinance, the drones can't fly there. They would put in a geofencing. Um, I know that the that NASA has been looking into piloting a program to fund this research to be able to do this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how how far along they are. Uh, that's something I, I could check into for next week, though. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I, I I would be interested to know what NASA's doing with this as well, um, because it's kind of a departure, just as flying drones are sort of a departure from from other aircraft, right? There are if you're going to fly an actual airplane, there there are a whole lot more regulatory uh, compliance issues that you, you have to and you face. Also and, yeah, you you also have the skin in the game factor. Mm, uh, yeah, <laughs> you're which, on board. Which is which which is a big factor. Um, I've I've flown in small planes, and and you don't you don't take risks when you're in them. So right, exactly. Um, you do. You you definitely um have a self interest there that that you know if you crash your drone into somebody's property might might be um not as severe. Although you, the, I don't know if you guys have ever priced those DJI Phantoms. You don't want to crash them if you bought one. <laughs> no, you do not. Not cheap. <laughs> um. So uh, along those lines, let's get back uh, out into the water um, and consider the issue of drone surfing, Sean. Mm -hmm. uh, just something that caught my eye. I thought you might uh, like to talk about now that we um, know that there are various onerous requirements uh, on people. Uh, they may or may not be um, overly onerous, but there's certainly things that most people don't know about uh, and probably aren't complying with as they're taking out their drones and flying them for 
fun and profit. Um, here's a way you could fly probably for both. Uh, surfing behind your drone. I can't tell if that guy's on a skimboard or what. How is he? Out yeah, there? what is he on? <laughs> I don't. Kind of looks like a skimboard. It must have. Maybe they have special boards just no, to do this with. There are boards with motors on them, um, but uh -huh. the, you know, not really surfing. That's that's something else entirely. That still looks fun. Looks like a I would do board, that, isn't it? Well, kite surfing, surfing, right? <laughs> Oh, oh, sure, yeah, and it's a sure. blast too. Um, I, so, I haven't yeah, done no, it. Looks amazing. Here we go. Yeah, it says uh, it says he is riding a skimboard, and there must be some sort of, uh, or or maybe not, at least some grippy stuff on the skimboard, so he's not falling <laughs> off of it as he's getting um, towed behind the drone. But I'm pretty sure uh, is he piloting the drone? That's a little hard to see if he's holding a remote control to do that. Or is someone towing him around? Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of questions from this picture. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I hope that these folks are aware <laughs> of what they're supposed to do, so as not to run afoul of the FAA rules for what they're up to. It looks super fun, by the way. Mm. Um, yeah, I think this is yeah. great. I grew up on a small lake, and, and you look at the price of boats, and boats, and you're looking at one hundred twenty thousand um, dollars. I think there's a real market for for this kind of thing. So I'm excited. Right. Me too. All right. So, um, it, and especially in Southern California, you know, uh, this one could kill two bir birds with one stone, right? It could fly you through the surf zone and then um, film all the grumpy surfers along the way. <laughs> 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 uh, all right. So I think we've um, had enough of our uh, surf and drone regulation discussion. Um I, oh, I, I'm okay, not sure cool. if <laughs> I'm not sure if we have the right panel this week. What your guys' interest is to go too deeply into uh, what's going on with net neutrality, but uh, it's probably um, worth at least mentioning that uh, the new FCC chairman's plan uh, to change the way the open net, uh, open internet rules work. Um, and reclassify fixed and mobile internet providers as common carriers under Title II of the Communications Act uh, is moving forward apace. And uh, we should this week have uh, gotten down the pipe a notice of proposed rulemaking, which will seek comment on the new FCC chairman's plan and uh, ultimately will result in uh, a vote later this year. Um, there's a vote scheduled for May 18th. Uh, so if you're following along with um, the future of net neutrality, um, these things are definitely going on. And I'm sure we will cover uh, more about it on the show as things do move forward. Um, so far, nothing has changed, but uh, Actions are in place to make those changes. Uh, any thoughts, Matt? Um, yeah, I, I think that this is, you know, uh, they're, they're certainly not costless to have net neutrality in there. Um, you know, you have to increase your broadband in order to make these companies available. Um, but the way that the market is structured is, is that these things are so vertically integrated. The, the ability for a company to um, use this as a leveraging tool just to get uh, massive amounts of, of funding from you know a YouTube or a Netflix or something like that. I I see no value in going back. I think that uh, yes, there's costs of having net neutrality. Those costs far outweigh the the you know the negative impact that 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 that's happened and that's likely to happen. Right. Uh, anything you want to add, Sean? Well, um, uh, our, our new president could consider uh, eliminating net neutrality. His his big win. Uh, something nobody asked for and companies are clamoring for and, and you know good for him he's at least he'll get something you know he get he's got that 100 day mark coming up um hasn't done much so maybe at least he can destroy net neutrality yeah that that won't happen by tomorrow either though tomorrow's the <laughs> no, 100 no. day mark <laughs> so i'm afraid that one doesn't get to go in the column just yet 
All right, uh, let us move along then. Uh, we're going to the Victor in the studio portion of the show. Uh, something that none of us on the panel had heard of until we all got on Skype and started getting ready to go live with you today. Uh, but it's super interesting and we want to talk about it anyway. It involves the social web. Uh, so, Victor, I think maybe you better tee this one up for us. Tell us uh, what caught your eye and and why it was interesting. Um. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, essentially, there's um, and actually, on some of our other shows like Ham Nation, we 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 were talking about the Radio Shacks closing down, and uh, mm -hmm. um, there was one that had a uh, Facebook account. And um, started uh, um, posting. It uh, went rogue. Yeah, it went rogue. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, and I mean, it, it was. It, I mean, it, it was. Uh, um, like you can see there. I, I don't think I should say it out loud, but. Um, <laughs> It started. It started getting positively sassy and insulting, right. and. Uh, it, a whole bunch of interesting issues going on here. Um, number one is the fact that uh, apparently, although there are official social media presences for Radio Shack in general, um, the reason this one store was able to start saying uh, insulting things as it shut down for the last time, always hated all of you blank customers anyway, we closed blank you all. <laughs> Um, this was the Reynoldsburg, Ohio stores account. So apparently uh, as a company, um, it was never a problem before for um, Radio Shack to have its individual stores have their own accounts. There were probably good reasons to have that happen. Hey, we're having a sale in Reynoldsburg, Ohio that you know, radios, Radio Shack Central might not be concerned about. Uh, but it goes to show you what can happen uh, when um, employees have access, and uh, certainly, I'm guessing that these insulting tweets were uh, had absolutely no authorization from <laughs> Radio Shack what are they corporate do, fire him? <laughs> HQ. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the, the the store is shut down, and the people have been fired. So, you know, beware of disgruntled employees with um, no skin in the game to keep <laughs> moderating their behavior in a yeah. corporately responsible way. Um, well, the corporate but, response kind of shows you what how much they care also. Oops. Yes. Can you show <laughs> us that, Victor? There we go. So this is what uh, Radio Shack Central posted <laughs> on their Twitter page. <laughs> <laughs> which, um, uh, which, which again, we, you know, I've never had occasion to really pay attention to the official Radio Shack Twitter page, but they're kind of cheeky and sassy themselves. So, um, what's amazing in, though is they only have ninety-one yeah. likes. Yeah, and this is a verified account. <laughs> I don't know. I this is this all seems a little weird. There are only ninety-one likes. What on that one tweet? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, because who the heck follows corporate uh, yeah. Twitter <laughs> accounts with any kind of regularity? And maybe that's what they're trying to address. They have some, you know, uh, kind of young, hip social media manager saying we're going to grab people's attention and we're going to grab it hard. But um, apparently the, the disgruntled employees had more success with that. At least um, they were trying to capitalize on it. Um, so, but a bunch of social media issues here, uh, you know, of course, as a company is winding down and closing things, they are going to want to pay attention to what social media accounts are out there and who has access. This all sort of, um, is, uh, striking a chord with what happened to various government accounts a few months ago and, um, how various accounts were used as protest, uh, actual official accounts were used as pro protest vehicles and others sprang up as um, alternative speech mechanisms uh, or so they cast themselves. 
Um, what else, uh, you know, aside from going after these people and of course firing them, which of course they've already been fired, uh, perhaps we could, um, the, the company could go after them for uh, some sort of trade libel for uh, painting the corporate brand in um, a bad light, some sort of misappropriation of corporate trademarks and things. Of course, none of that stuff is going to happen, but um, there there are definitely legal ramifications should you find yourself in the position <laughs> of <laughs> a disgruntled employee with access to a social media account. Um, you know, you're not completely off the hook or you might not be completely off the hook if you decide to um, go rogue. So Sean, it, it anything for the dad? So it won't endanger any, um, any uh, sale of our battery, the, you know, the battery mailing, mailing list signing mailing yes. Right, exactly. Stuff. I mean, you know, they, okay. they do have a brand that they have to maintain the value of. They have assets that are still viable and and uh, sure. need to be preserved. So I think, I think we're again going back to the court of public opinion. Um, yeah. I, I thought the, those tweets are really funny. And I think um, it kind of highlights, I mean, while it's maybe not Radio Shack's preferred publicity, I think it really does highlight the fact that um, in my view, maybe the only really good use of Twitter has been uh, authentic interaction between major corporations and their consumers or client base. Um, and you actually get these uh, Twitter accounts for various companies that are making a real effort to connect with people on a personal level. And I think that's really wonderful um, it, with regard to what sort of legal cause of action they have. While I think that the wrong move would be to sue somebody, and I think they never would, um, there is a cause of action for false light. And false light requires um, some, some amount of publicity. It requires uh, the publicity be about some matter concerning another. So in this case, Radio Shack. Uh, it needs to put that person in a false light or that entity in a false light. Um, and it has to be highly offensive and you have to have acted uh, with knowledge or reckless disregard for that other entity. So mm -hmm. uh, just looking very briefly at those elements, um, it looks like it does fit into that tort. But like I said, Radio Shack would be foolish to sue because they've not only gotten a whole bunch of free publicity – um, they have been able to, even though it didn't get much uh, attention, respond on their own official Twitter account and look like they're, um, you know, have that air of authenticity that I think a lot of companies really strive for. So overall, I think it's a it's a win for <laughs> Radio Shack. Uh, because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The new, Radio Shack wouldn't be in the news. They wouldn't be seen as young and cool, uh, you know, as young as cool as you can appear as a big company. But um, overall, I think they win. Uh, even if whoever it was who posted on the uh, Ohio Radio Shack account um, maybe wasn't trying to help them, um, I think they ultimately did. All right. Anything to add, Matt? Yeah, I, I I think that there's, um, as well as a tort, I, I'm sure that the uh, local owner of the franchise uh, has a contract with them in terms of what they can put um, on, on their Facebook and have to be promotional um, in their social media. So they could go after them, which you're going to get a lot more damage from the franchise owner than you're going to get from, um, you know, uh, an employee. So ultimately, God, I hope they don't go after anybody, but um, yeah. I do think that there's the, the way to go after them there. Well, if their if their Twitter account is any indication, um, they're just kind of taking it all in stride. But one <laughs> yeah, never knows. That's the way. All right, uh, moving on. I think we're ready for our animal selfie of the week. Play, 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 says the song. Mm. Uh, I think we have some video we can play, play, play uh, for you. We are taking a departure from uh, our um, animal selfie requirements uh, that are generally stringently enforced on this show, which would be that the animal itself uh, is somehow involved in taking the picture. Uh, that is not the case here. But since we have been um, much discussing drone video of surfers and surfing, uh, I stumbled across this video uh, that the video operator 
um, had a good deal of trepidation about as he was taking it because he was filming some surfers. Uh, we don't know if he had permission from the surfers to do so. <laughs> uh, but he noticed, and I don't know if you're watching the video with us, you can see there is a largest shark swimming right under the surfers. Uh, this took place in Australia and was reported in the Sydney Morning Herald. And the um, drone operator, once he realized there was a shark right under the surfers, uh, immediately dropped his remote control and ran and found a lifeguard and uh, or tried to find a lifeguard, but there was no lifeguard there, but tried to um, let some of the surfers know, hey, big shark under you, um, trying to be a good citizen. Uh, the um, good that the guy was trying to do was probably um, fairly useless <laughs> in this particular situation because uh, commentators have uh, looked at the shark and the footage and decided it was a gray nurse shark. And uh, having swum with those myself and having thrown small children in to swim with them, I can um, firmly attest that surfers on top of a gray nurse shark are not an issue at all. They um, are more like pussy cats that's right down to the whiskers. Um, th that's not to say they can't be harmful at all. You don't want to put your fingers in their way because they will try and slurp everything up that they think is food. Uh, but they're certainly not going to attack you in the way um, a dangerous shark would. Yeah, Ke so, Kevin, um, our resident yes. uh, shark expert, um, just mm -hmm. ran in here saying that, yeah, that was a nurse shark and they're yeah. not, not you, they're okay. Yeah. They're <laughs> he he just came back from, he just came back expert. from swimming with them, so. <laughs> yeah. Do you know where Kevin went to do that? Uh, I went to Belize to swim with nurse sharks. He went to Belize. Belize, oh, yes. So, um, yes, nurse sharks are, are great to swim with because you feel, you know, you feel very James Bond when you're doing it, as you can see <laughs> video. Uh, they're good sized sharks and they, you know, they've got the tail and the fin and, uh, but they, they don't have, um, aggression. There's something that you can, um, scuba dive with, uh, it, with impunity. And, um, as long as, you know, you don't want to, you don't ever want to hassle a shark, any kind of shark, but, um, these ones are not a danger to the, uh, the drone captured surfers. Anything you want to add, Sean? Uh, well, I'll give you the uh, at least the surfer's perspective on sharks generally is that uh, you understand when you go in the water with any regularity that that's where sharks live. Um, so <laughs> they attack very infrequently. I think I have better odds of getting into the NBA than being bitten by sharks. So that's pretty comforting. Um, and I don't even play basketball. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's where they are. That's where they live. You're going out into their habitat. You're taking a risk every time you get in the water. It's a low risk, and that's what you kind of deal with. Um, so I, I think uh, in that video, you could kind of see that the the girl on the whiteboard seemed to notice the shark at some point. But, you know, what can you do? You can um, wait until you get a wave and go in, or you can panic and flail and look like a dying seal that might be really tasty to chomp on. Um, so best thing you do is just keep your cool and paddle in if you're concerned. Um, right. the, the, the concerning stuff for me is, uh, if you see a whole bunch of seals nearby, because you know, that's shark food. Um, mm -hmm. and if you're in a place with a, an inlet or a slough or anything like that, where seals are often coming in and out, then you know that you're kind of in an area where sharks may be hunting. Um, but I've been surfing for nine years and I've seen maybe one or two sharks and they're always small or they're never anything serious. Um, and I've, I've been out surfing in water that's crystal clear and seals are swimming underneath me and it's really cool. It's a fun experience, but you never really think about the sharks. And I, I think the people that are overly concerned with sharks are the people that decide surfing's not for them anyway. Yes. Um, I think we will make sharks live there. Our next, <laughs> uh, <laughs> our next fast phrase for the show. I realize we need a second one, and that one is going to be it. Sharks live there. There's one uh, technological aspect, tech tech fail aspect to this story uh, that I guess is worth mentioning. And that was that there was a shark buoy monitoring that area that was supposed to go off and warn of the course. surfers. And yet, of course, it never went off. So uh, don't don't rely on your local shark buoy, I guess, surfers. Um, our tip of the week, uh, again, involves drones. We're having a kind of a droney show today. And again, involves Australia. And uh, in this particular uh, incident, 
a woman came home from work, uh, went into her backyard, took off her clothing. She was as naked as a security robot, folks, and <laughs> jumped right into her, what she considered her secluded backyard pool. Um, and then noticed that there was a quadcopter copter drone hovering close overhead uh, with a camera, um, just hanging out there, um, getting footage of her skinny dipping. And there is a, uh, our tip here uh, applies in both Australia and in the United States. And it's that backyard skinny dipping is not as private as you might think. Uh, a law professor, uh, Brendan Gogarty from the University of Tasmania, Tasmania has a lengthy dissertation under Australian law um, illustrating that tip uh, and illustrating how under their law, um, although the woman might have felt like she was private in her backyard, um, someone could legally fly a drone and take footage and there's probably uh, not much she can do about it. Um, short of, uh, again, again, this is not a legal remedy, but a practical one, uh, you might want to invest in geofencing technology as Matt was mentioning uh, or start looking into it um, if you are bound and determined to shield your backyard activities from someone flying um, a low flying camera nearby. Um, same thing holds true in the United States. Uh, we had a piece in the rundown today um, that is still there for you to read if you'd like to. We haven't discussed it on the show, but it's it's the latest uh, shooting down of a drone that had strayed over someone's property to the point where they felt justified in shooting it down. Uh, that has happened again, and it was written up at Ars Tech Technica if you'd like to look into it further. Um, and more light in that piece as well discussed that here in the U.S., um, again, we have not recognized any sort of aerial trespass. Um, so it, it, the drone could be over your property and probably is just fine to be there. Um, again, the FAA has rules and guidelines about flying over people, but the FAA isn't going to try and start policing whether something is a trespass or not. So our tip of the week is uh, whether you're patrolling a parking lot late at night in your $7 an hour security drone capacity or skinny dipping in your backyard, you might wanna think about what sort of attire that you've chosen to go with uh, in that context. Uh, we have a couple of resources of the week for you. We're taking a break from our series on ISP privacy, only a one week break. And that's because I just simply didn't have time this week. Um, a, to get the post up that I want to do about last week's privacy policies, but look for that. I will put it up on Facebook. Uh, and secondly, to delve into the Verizon and Frontier ones. So I'm hoping next week is a little bit uh, more, gives me a little bit more latitude to do both those things. And uh, we'll get, we'll continue on with our deep dives into ISP privacy policies when we can. But I don't want to leave you without resources of the week. And I actually have three of them. Uh, if you're uh, willing to wait for your Verizon and uh frontier policy. Uh, one of them comes from Sean, and that is uh, the fact that Sean does these great guides. If you've been oh interested God, you in <laughs> the, yeah, I found those. They're pretty cool um, and they're free. Uh, you do have to give him uh, your name and email address. Sean, you're going to do good things with that data, right? Oh yeah. I actually you're haven't gotten around <laughs> to sending an email to anybody that's signed up. They've just gotten free guides. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so free time. guides. There are a couple of them available. Um, one is the uh, Essential Guide to Trademarks for those in the surf industry, uh, help you helping you build a brand, helping you um, uh, understand the intellectual property framework. Uh, the next is the Essential Guide to Skate and Surf Shops. So if all of this surf talk is making you um, run to Southern California and want to get into this industry yourself, uh, Sean's going to help you out with a great guide on everything you need to know before you open your doors. So those are really cool, Sean. Thanks for putting those out. They look nice too. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a couple of more resources to check out. Uh, I know we have talked about recap before on the show. Um, this is the uh, Chrome and Firefox 
extension that if you are a PACER user, PACER is um, the electronic access system for U.S. federal district and bankruptcy courts. Uh, it tends to be a little expensive and these are all public records. So what Recap does is if you're a PACER user and you're get it, you're coming up with something, you're searching for something, you're printing something um, that is not already in the Recap archive, uh, it will note that and it will build its archive off of um, the contributions of various PACER users. So it's in the process of creating an archive with uh, millions of documents and that archive is all free, unlike PACER, which is not. It will also um, tell you about uh, what documents you can access for free so you can keep your PACER expenses as low as possible. Uh, there is something similar in the scientific world now, and it is called unpaywall. It doesn't work exactly the same as re, uh, Recap, but it is a browser plugin for both Chrome and Firefox um, that if you are doing scientific research, this is kind of cool, um, and you find a summary or a part of an article, you know how you just get those little snippets and then that's the teaser to get you to come in and uh, either um, get yourself behind that paywall one way or, or another or otherwise pay for the article. Uh, when you're on that summary page, what unpaywall will do is it gives you a little lock. Um, and if the lock comes, a little graphic of a lock, and if the lock comes up green, it's telling you that that paper is available somewhere not behind a paywall and for free. And it will show you where that is available. So kind of um, a couple of good information sources there for you. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up this episode of This Week in Law. Uh, it's a sunny day here in SoCal. I don't know what the surface looking like, but it's definitely getting to be the time of year where it's great to be <laughs> out is. there. Are, are you right, hitting the waves right. this afternoon, Sean? Uh, not this afternoon. Unfortunately, I dislocated my shoulder recently, so I'm taking a little bit of time to get better. Um, but we're headed into summertime, which means south swells and warm water, and I'm really looking forward to it. Good, good. Yes, it's a great time to be at the beach uh, in the next few months here in SoCal. Uh, sorry to tantalize that you with that, Matt, but you should just come visit us. <laughs> yeah, I've actually got family uh, in Dana Point, so some so at some point we'll have to make it out and uh, grab a drink or something. That'd good, be good. Have you ever surfed? Um, you could call it surfing. Uh, <laughs> many wouldn't, uh, but you could call was it was involved. <laughs> uh, I don't think you could get a picture of me because I don't stay up that long, but uh, I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't feel bad. I took I took surf lessons for two months every Saturday, eight a.m. for two months, and I didn't stand up until the very last day, and I've never stood up since. It is it not something that really it took with me. Takes time. Yes, it yeah, does. I think a, a cousin of mine is a she's a lifeguard there, and she loves it. <laughs> so um, she keeps telling me she's going to teach me, but we'll see. Yep. <laughs> It's just great to get out there in the water, um, commune with all our leopard sharks that we have here in Southern California. And yeah. every now and then something a little bit more problematic, but very seldom. All right. It's been really fun doing this show with you too. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank all of you Thank who've you. joined us either live or after the fact watching the video. There are various ways that you can join us. Um, if you like to join us live, we record the show every Friday at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC. If you head to twit.tv slash live, that's where you're going to catch us at that time. And you can jump into IRC with us then too and play along. Let us know what you're thinking of the show in real time. Help us uh, find the things that we uh, inevitably forget about and need to be reminded of on the show. It's so helpful, IRC. Thank you for always doing that and joking with us and laughing with us all along the show. Um, There's a lot of it, good show titles in there today. Yeah, I've been noticing. Thank you for all of those too. Ah, uh, what else? So yeah, there's IRC at irc.twit.tv. Jump in there with us. But don't worry about it if uh, the show doesn't fit into your schedule in its live time frame. If you go to twit.tv slash twill, our whole archive of shows is there for you uh, and various ways to 
enjoy the show at your leisure on your device of choice. So um, definitely, we're just thrilled you join us however you can. Please uh, do get in touch with us between the shows. Let us know uh, if we made you think of something, reminded you of something and go and say, oh God, yeah, I remember hearing about a case or a person or whatever you guys should really know about since you were talking about this. You can email us, Matt is Matt C at twit.tv. I am Denise at twit.tv. Mike, who's not here this week is Mike at twit.tv. Uh, let us know what's going on uh, in your lives, things that you think uh, we need to know about guests that we should invite on the show, stories that you think are important that we should cover, uh, all of it. We love hearing from you, love having you be a part of the show. In fact, we could not do this show without you. So thank you so much for all of your participation in the show. Um, we will be back next week with the show. Between then, if uh, you don't feel like emailing us and you do feel like interacting, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, our Twitter handles have been up throughout the show and uh, where else can you find us? Uh, we do have a Google Plus page. I, I will say I'm about ready to say goodbye to the Google Plus social media presence. <laughs> so, You're probably the so, last person still on there. I know. Right. <laughs> so, um, if, yeah, if, you're, if you're a huge fan of the Google Plus page or community, do let me know. Otherwise, I think we're gonna just kind of let it die a quiet death. Otherwise, come on over to Facebook where we do have a page that is much more lively. Um, leave us your comments there and uh, we do post up things there that relate to the show during the week. In fact, uh, this week I should be able to get a post up about Time Warner Cable and Spectrum's privacy and opt out things that we discussed last week. So keep an eye out for that. And uh, until next week, we hope you all do well. Happy surfing, uh, good waves and uh, watch out. Watch out for the nurse sharks and don't freak out if you want. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. Take care, everyone. <laughs>